In Boca. Chats with Richard Davies. Richard Davies is a specialist at Abe Books, one of the largest purveyors of rare and collectible books in the world. His knowledge of rare books and cookbooks is vast, so we couldn't wait to ask him about the Mboka series. Let's get into it. You know, you checked out the project that we're doing, and we're focusing on a series of books called Mboka, which was printed in 1976. Uh, that was the first publishing by Il Vespro. It's a series of cardboard-bound cookbooks that are written in Italian, English, and regional dialect, and they have some very strange recipes uh, along with some great history and uh, really nice wood cutting um, lithographs and uh, hand paintings. And um, I, I guess my first question is, are you familiar with the books and what's your take on them? No, I, I wasn't familiar with the books. So um, church associations, community associations, all produce small print run cookbooks to support their organizations. Mm -hmm. So initially I thought it was something like that. Those, those cookbooks incidentally are great and you can get all sorts of wonderful recipes out of them. However, once I looked up the cookbooks, I saw the colors. And as you've said, and as you said in the film, the colors jump off the page. They are vibrant. Yes. And then I realized they weren't a hastily put together cookbook um, using uh, cardboard box covers. <laughs> but that, that was actually part of the, the project of the, that the publisher did. So then uh, once I heard about the recipes, I, I continued to be intrigued. It's um, whoever put them together was quite the artist. Yes. Um, the publisher... Um, which I've recently been in contact with, who's retired now, uh, said that it was one of his, if not his favorite productions ever. He really put a lot of effort into it and uh, they really took over a life of their own. And he said that his sister was actually one of the women that penned a lot of the recipes in the books. That's her handwriting. Um, you know, as a bookseller that deals in in older books, do you see like that level of uh, personality in books where things are handwritten and then transferred? Or is it mostly type? Like, is it a rare thing to see handwritten works of, uh, of publishing? Yes, there's, uh, there's different streams to publishing. You've got mass market publishers that, you know, bring out huge volumes of books published, uh, written by, say, Jamie Oliver, right? He, he brings out two or three books a year. Right. But there's a different stream. There's smaller publishers that bring, bring out things, what are called um, fine press books, mm -hmm. very small print runs, and they're dedicated to the art, or they might have very particular uh, beautiful bindings, or use very high quality paper, or even print it very, very carefully on a, on a small print, mm -hmm. a small pr um, printing press. So um, the level of care that, the, that your publisher put into that project matches what is still going around today and, and has been done for centuries. The whole idea of producing a small number of beautiful books isn't that unusual, but it just doesn't get the attention that the, the big million dollar seller cookbooks do get from, sure. the, from the mainstream sure. media. That's interesting. Um, have they, and I know you cook, you, you also make sausage, right? I am. I, I have a sausage, I have a meat grinder <laughs> in the basement. <laughs> I don't know how many people you want to tell that to, but um, that's, that's wild. Um, what are you, some of your favorite cookbooks that might be uh, not well known to the general public? Oh God, there's so many. There's so Great. many, so many things that I, I love. I love um, cookbooks from different eras. Mm -hmm. um, I love unusual cookbooks humorous cookbooks. Um, one really good example is from the 1950s, and it's a dark satire cookbook called Cooking to Kill. <laughs> and it has these ghoulish and gothic recipes uh, accompanied by little illustrations about how to basically get rid of your in-laws or unwanted guests by Great adding- Wedding presents or- uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was published as a joke uh, by a company called Peter Pauper Press, okay. uh, and it's quite obscure. So there's only about two or three copies available on eight books. And I was in a bookstore in Seattle once and um, walking around, and I was just browsing. And I looked by the till, and they had a copy of this book just by the till, and I recognized it straight away. 
And I said, oh, how much is that? And the guy said, $10. So I, I snapped it up because it's probably a $100 book. Um, I like that sort of thing. Um, I like weird cookbooks as well. Yeah. One example, but the first weird cookbook I came across years ago when I started this job was one called uh, Manifold Destiny, Cooking on Your Car Engine, which was uh, just very strange to me. I, I couldn't believe I thought it was a joke book. And I contacted the author for an interview, and he was quite put off that I'd suggested that it was weird. Um, so what happens if you're a trucker and you're driving across the desert in the 50s and there are no truck stops? You have a piece of chicken that you bought at breakfast, you wrap it in foil, you put it on your engine and you drive 50 miles. You stop <laughs> and your chicken is cooked. Uh, it's a real thing. People do do it. And he prepared all these recipes that you can cook on your car engine and the distances are in miles, right? You don't have a, <laughs> no thermometer. Don't have a heat. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what a crazy book. Um, I'm driving to Pittsburgh. What can I make? Oh, roast chicken. That's, that's great. <laughs> yeah. There's all that's sorts so of other weird ones uh, about uh, eating insects. Um, I've, another one I found is called the special effects cookbook yeah. where you can cook with kids and you've got all these bubbling food that can explode or, or what have you. Uh, that's a lot of fun. Um, sometimes I like, I'm also drawn to the cookbooks produced by celebrities. So that's a really, uh, huge part of modern publishing, right? Anyone who's anyone produces a cookbook, but it's not always the celebrities you think would produce it. Um, there's an actor called Dom DeLuise. Well, there was an actor called Dom DeLuise. Of course. He, Cannibal he's Run. Done, yeah. 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 He was in Blazing Saddles for a, a little bit. Um, he does Italian cook or he did Italian cookbooks. Uh, he, you can get them quite easily. They're, they're out of print now. Um, there's all sorts of others. The actor, uh, the horror actor, Vincent Price mm -hmm. was also a huge gourmet fan. And when he traveled around the world doing, uh, doing movies, he would stop at the best restaurants, eat and also collect their restaurants and uh, so, so their, their best recipes. Sure. And he and his wife put together a, a um, a cookbook called um, A Treasury of Great Recipes. And it was published in the late 60s, early 70s, and went out of print. However, it had many great recipes. And uh, it was eventually brought back into print about five or six years ago. But that's an example of a pretty high-class uh, cookbook that went out of print but had a big following and people still wanted to see the recipes. That's interesting. I actually asked my mother about that. She had that cookbook. Oh, wow. Her mother made a dish out of it. I can't remember what it was, but she was like, I have to buy this. And she said it was wild. She, and she knew exactly what I was talking about after I talked to you. Right. It's really cool. Um, so having not known these books and having watched the film that we made about them, um, what's your takeaway about this series of cookbooks? Like where do they kind of lie in the spectrum of, of, um, you know, books and, and in general, like in rarity and how maybe important they are or how special they are. So uh, I would describe them as a, well, a beautiful curiosity. The cardboard covers make them unusual because it's not, it's not logical, right? It's not practical for cookbooks to have right. cardboard covers. <laughs> it's the worst. Um, but the art and the nature of the printing, uh, the handwritten printing um, makes them, uh, makes them uh, worth something. Um, so I, I believe Peter had put together the collection of 20. So that's exactly how yeah. some book collectors work. Yeah, he finally but, finished his collection, which is a, is a big moment yeah. Yeah. For, for him, for sure. So the fact that there's a series and each one is um, regional and has some... Um, Authentic recipes from each reason, re region, that's lovely, right? Mm. So if you're a collector, there's a type of collector called um, like a, a completist, right? They want all the James Bond first editions if you were very, very wealthy, right? They're thousands and thousands of dollars. But to go through a whole series and collect everything, that's a really common trait in book collectors. So I smiled when I heard Peter had got all 20, right? Because he <laughs> must have been punched here when he got the 20th one. 
Yeah. And finding them are, are, it's an interesting treasure hunt, much like the one that you found, uh, you know, where it's like, oh, this, this person doesn't really know the value of this. And uh, everyone kind of walks away very excited because they're happy to sell it for what they think it's worth. And then, you know, to get it for less than what maybe its market value is, uh, which, you know, is inflated by many, many different reasons is always a good feeling. So that last book, you know, by a private seller, it's special. And then, you know, you, to me, the pleasure of all of them are, they all kind of have this weird connection with where you got them and then what they represent. So you yeah. always kind of remember them like relationships. Like, oh, I remember this guy, I met him there and he sold me this and he told me about that. And yeah. you know, the, the, the journey that goes in collecting the books is almost as profound as, you know, the meals that you're making out of them, you know? So it, it's, it's been interesting with these books and, and talking with you has only inspired me to, to look at some of these other bizarro cookbooks and find more wild recipes from different cultures and seeing if we can uh, reproduce them back at home. Yeah, there's many more out there. And they don't seem to get the press that the big novels get and all that sort of thing. They're a little bit, um, they go under the radar a lot. So, and often they don't get the, the publicity that the big major cookbooks do get associated with a famous chef or a celebrity or celebrity chef or something like that. So yeah, there's a lot of fun to collecting cookbooks. And often when you, when you, when you acquire a cookbook that's been around for decades, you're not just getting a cookbook because often they're annotated by the previous owner. Also, you'll find things like um, uh, cut out recipes from newspapers that have been put into the back. Also, where sometimes the recipes are tweaked by the owner because they think the original recipe is wrong and their slight substitution is better. So you can get a lot of additional information from these cookbooks that have gone through several hands uh, before ending up with you. Yeah, I think that's that's fascinating. Imagine finding that in a dictionary or a medical journal. <laughs> like, this is a good way to take a liver out, but I have a better suggestion. And uh, yeah, these books, the, these cookbooks in particular are interesting because they're not so technical where they're down to the exact science of cooking. They tell you, make a mayonnaise, get a red sauce going, cook the meat, like that's it. And they leave it up to you to to fill in the blanks I think because at least when these books were written in Italy, people made food at home anyway. So you're going to make it a little different than someone else. So you make your red sauce, you make your mayonnaise, you cook the meat how you know how to do it so that the recipe comes out tasting like you made it versus like, this is how I do it. Now follow the recipe because this is law, you know? And I think that interpretation, like you're saying annotations and all that, it adds a little life to the books and and makes them special, Have have a life of their own almost. Yeah. I was wondering what the Naples one was like. Does it address pizza? It's just cursing. It's it's 416 pages of horrible words and insults of your mother. And uh, no, they do address pizza. There's a lot of sauce. It's one of my favorites, actually, because Neapolitan food, people obviously associate it with pizza, red sauce, things of that nature. But there's a lot more to it. And, you know, in general, these books kind of deal with like the more obscure, older recipes that you don't see on restaurants anymore. I mean, one of the major things that Peter and I have like, uh, you know, pick a bone about is certain dishes kind of always float to the top. Everyone wants to eat a carbonara. Everyone wants to eat the, you know, used to be Alfredo sauce, like didn't even exist. But it's because people keep saying it over and over again and they forget older dishes that there was variety back in the day before Yelp and the internet. So yeah. there wasn't this like fake self inflation of like the importance of a dish. So to revisit these old flavors and these old weird dishes, um, they're not that weird. They, they make sense. And you know, that's one of the reasons I love cookbooks, which I'm sure you do too, is that they don't, um, the history is, is untainted. You can't mess with it. It is what it is. The food is what it is. It represents the culture at the time and there's no way to flavor it or color it where it's like out of fashion. That's just right. it. You know, this is the dish. I was wondering what the Sardinia one looked like as well. I wonder if it had like hunting, like rabbit stew or something like that. A lot of rabbit. It's got that funky cheese, the katsumare, the, the worm cheese. Oh, yeah. Right. 
Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, Sardinia, also the language is fascinating of all of Italy. It's, it's a brackish mix of uh, French and uh, Corsican and uh, you get a little bit of everything in there. So uh, if you ever visit and you speak Italian, you probably don't understand anything, which is a fun, a fun little adventure to have to at a restaurant. Yeah. Well, this is great. Um, Richard, I really appreciate you taking the time and talking to you. You're so fascinating. And I don't think people talk about books nearly enough or read them, frankly. We should read more books. Don't we should you read more books. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's my motto for life. Read more I, books. I agree. And you have a podcast, is that correct? I do have a podcast called Behind the Bookshelves, yes. I highly recommend it to everyone. It will open your mind and open some books, which, uh, like we say, everyone, everyone needs. It's good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. We'll be in touch, definitely, because I'm going to pick your brain every five minutes about things that uh, I find interesting, and I hope you do too. And uh, yeah, we'll talk again soon. Yeah, all the best. Okay, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 20 Rare Cookbooks, 4 Tasty Dishes, 2 Best Friends. Watch the film, see the books, help Italy recover. Get hungry at italyinboca.com. Italy in Boca.